Jackson gave me the news of a planet far away And Colonel O'Neill will assemble a team that will try to save the day Dr. Sam has a master plan and a science attitude And the Jaffa Teal is part of the deal with his trusty go It's just a regular day at Stargate Command And it might be hard to understand Welcome back, everyone, to Three Fries Short, Unearthing the Stargate. Welcome. Welcome, so welcome. We have a special guest with us today. Yes. I'm very excited. So we have uh, Lawrence Cow with us today, who is a co-creator of the Companion app. Do you you say Companion app, correct? Because it's mostly an, an app? Yeah. Or... I mean, to be honest, we just call it the Companion, mm -hmm. like, like you would the, the Economist or the Guardian or anything else. But um, yeah. it is an app. There is an yeah. app. Because when you look it up, it's the Companion.app. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would love the dot com, but it costs, I think, $14,000. So, wow. so when we get a little bit bigger, uh, we'll, we'll go and get that, hopefully. <laughs> wow. OK. Um, wow. Uh, just to, to tell you a little bit, I guess I'll tell you how I came to find out about the companion um, and we, we can go from there. But basically, I follow Amanda Tapping on social media and she posted out earlier this year about her uh uplifting women in film um and i thought i was got super excited about it i also um in in my non-day job i work in film <laughs> but i also have a day job so the the idea of of hearing her especially because i know she does a lot of directing to be able to talk about women in the industry um was super interesting so i went on and i like i paid for the companion um, and then I realized there's all this other content that's there and it, I, I was, it was super exciting. And then when we started hearing more and more recently about the AI table read, I think that's when we really kind of kicked into overdrive with, with interest with it. So, um, that's, yeah, that's well, how first I came off, up. <laughs> thank you so much for signing up. Uh, it, it means so much to us, uh, Every morning when someone signs up, we we celebrate genuinely. <laughs> awesome. it, it's a little party, yeah, in the morning. So, so thank you so much. Yeah, um, well, Rebecca got us all kind of on it. So, and I guess we mm -hmm. should probably introduce ourselves real mm -hmm. quick. So our names sure. are on here, but um, yeah, <laughs> no, sorry. Um, so yeah, so I'm our I'm our West Coaster. Um, so just saying hi, so you know who we are. Yeah, um, and then we have I'm Sarah. I'm also East Coast. So me and Rebecca are on the same time zone. So yeah, yeah. No, I've definitely been checking out some some three fries short. <laughs> yeah. Content, oh yeah. Uh, oh. And I was uh, just doing my homework. <laughs> I, I just rewatched uh, large parts of the Sue Ann Braun uh, interview that yeah. oh, cool. the three of you did, which was which is awesome. And um, so yeah, yeah. Um, no, great, great to see you in in virtual person. I guess absolutely. <laughs> and nice to meet you too. So I, I yeah, I'm Rebecca. I'm also East Coast. Um, Sue Ann Braun. That was such a crazy thing for us i think because we were what she was our 10th episode um yeah yeah we were babies still babies but we were like <laughs> real baby baby at that point and we we're like um okay sure we got this oh no um, it was it was it was awesome like the questions and the research that you uh, all three of you did and then i think there were questions um from fans as well or, or i guess mm -hmm. other members etc yep. yeah that was really really cool so yeah really really glad that um yeah that all that came together it yeah it's cool it was super exciting, just the idea, um, and it's, I, I mean, I think The Companion does this really interestingly, too, and I've never seen anything quite like The Companion, which is also what makes it super interesting, but just the idea of getting con more of that content out and making it feel more like fans have access to those, you know, the mm -hmm. things, and I mean, Sue Ann Braun made that super easy even for us because I literally just tweeted to her and I was like, well, right. what's what's the harm in trying to talk to her or what's the harm in like reaching out? And she was super receptive, which I've since learned. I mean, as we've gone on, because we just interviewed Colin Cunningham as well. Um, they're, they're all super receptive, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's it's no, just no, been I really exciting. 
I think that's exactly how we uh, approach it as well. Um, you know, even though we had the opportunity to work on Stargate Command, really at the so time, cool. our relationship was with MGM, you know, mm. and, and studio execs. And um, uh, by the time kind of Stargate Command ended, uh, you know, I never had the chance to speak to anyone like Brad, uh, Brad Wright, you know, the co-creator or, mm -hmm. you know, Robert Cooper, uh, one of the other showrunners or Joe Malazzi, uh, Joseph Malazzi, you know, uh, and, um, uh, and exactly like, I think your mentality, we thought, well, why don't we just go to the very top? Why don't we just go right. and reach out to people? And the worst that thing that could happen is, is <laughs> they can say no. And so, mm -hmm. so we managed to, uh, you know, email and get a hold of Brad and, and so to cool. our surprise, you know, it was originally, Hey, do you think you can, maybe do one interview or write an article. And, and, and he said, no, like, I would love to be your advisor. Like I would love to wow. be creatively involved in this. Like, let's do this. So, so yeah, um, I think we share the same spirit. So awesome. how did that come to be your whole, like when Stargate command, how did that, like, what was your thought process on getting you into companion? Like where, what was that process for you? Just, yeah, I know so, you just touched on it, but no, no problem. So um, I used to, uh, this is probably around 2011, 2012. Um, yeah. I was very much in the uh, sports documentary world and mm. um, Google had invested in the company that I was at. So we were making really soccer documentaries, uh, even though I'm from California, uh, I'm based <laughs> in the UK. And so everything, you know, it's football effectively. Yeah, yeah right. Covering, covering <laughs> all that. And um, yeah, and one of the things that was interesting is I don't actually know anything about football, really, other than, you know, Same. David Beckham, and et cetera, but, but nothing, you know, more than that, maybe the LA Galaxy, which was nothing <laughs> had to do with what we're doing. Right. Um, but, you know, the thing that's interesting, and I think, Christina, you're the one, you're on TikTok as well, right? Yes. And... So the three of us are on TikTok. Oh, right. Okay. I think I'm the one who kind of during the AI experiment kind of commented <laughs> some of the discourse. Okay. Okay. Great. 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 Um, yeah. That's how we met actually was we, we all met on right, TikTok. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think what's interesting is um, with a lot of um, studios, production companies, filmmakers, they, they kind of think about maybe sometimes um, maybe a traditional method first, and then they sort of think about the platform. So it doesn't really fit very well. And I think with what uh, hopefully what, what the three of you are doing and what we were thinking about at the time is, okay, well, let's think about this. YouTube fans are actually fans of kind of YouTube and the platform. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of adapt um, or, or not even adapt, you create for the platform mm -hmm. rather than say, take a TV show and try to stick it onto say TikTok. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Right. And so that's the way we thought about it. And, um, and yeah, and Google invested into the company. And um, Nick, my business partner, he was one of the guys at Google that saw what we were doing and um, was on that kind of commissioning side. And so we worked for several years there until um, around 2015. Um, he emailed me out of the blue one day and he said, hey, do you think you know, we can do what you do now, but maybe like different and maybe better? Hmm. And it was this idea of um, online creators, content creators, they were doing much more than just YouTube now. Um, Instagram was starting to, you know, start to happen. Yeah. Um, I think Snapchat had either launched or was about to launch, but it was mm -hmm. it was still very very new. And so we knew that there were going to be all these different platforms, and we would, you know, you, you, as a creator, you're going to want to start to learn what well, what makes these things work and what are these communities, um, what are they like, and and how do we, you know, um, build something or create something specifically for them. And so, so we started a production company um, dedicated to, to that, which is how do you create BBC or Netflix quality content, but for a digital audience? And, and to be honest, like there wasn't a lot of broadcasters or studios really trying to approach it that way, right? It was like prestige right. is, is cinema, prestige mm -hmm. is television, and then social right. media is sort of this like extra thing. And right. we said, no, 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 in, in 2030, you know, in 15 years time, your director of photography, your DOP, they're just going to come from Instagram. And your director probably uploaded his first video on Vimeo. And mm -hmm. the sound guy, you know, the soundie is from SoundCloud. And, you know, and, and everyone's going to have an audience. And that's just how that's going to work. Um, and so why don't we just start that today? Uh, it'll be a little bit harder, um, cool. but, but let's try that. And so um, a very long-winded answer to, <laughs> I love to, that. No, this is um, so cool. to your question. Um, MGM started seeing what we were doing. And so um, 
the, the shows that we were previously making, um, they tended to be, um, some of them were actually quite serious and they really hit, I think, the, um, the topics that uh, really matter to, I would say, um, maybe like young parents or mm-hmm. kind of late, you know, late adults, uh, like teenagers, I mean. Um, so we had one um, that was a hit series that was um, What I Wish I'd Known About Porn. <laughs> and it, yeah, yeah. Um, but it covered um, a porn director who um, was leading a, pem- a feminist porn movement. Huh. Uh, I mean, this is kind of way too detailed, but... Oh, no, no. no. Anything goes here. Uh, oh, please, no. Yeah, this is yeah. no, Even... No. <laughs> you know how we have, like, shorter and shorter attention spans? Yeah, and, for uh, sure. Right, yep. Okay. Driven by social media. Well, yeah. things like Pornhub and everything else is also affecting lots of people yeah. in this way. Yeah. Um, and it also is not showing a very you know um well Realistic. it's not very it's not yeah it's not representative of sex or love right it's mm-hmm, right. like you know some random scene wham bam within eight minutes like people mm-hmm. can't even get through a 12 minute scene as an example and so no. this kind of movement is well how do you kind of almost bring some of the romance back to it um hmm. and so a lot of the kind of feminist porn movement is about um uh to be honest like lots of foreplay and those kind of things like that that's what that's what sex is and so yeah. so you, you get back to the half hour or one hour kind of mm-hmm. um kind of scene so um so that was episode one and then we had um another episode around porn addiction uh and also <laughs> one around um uh, gay porn and uh what he was doing uh with the U- united nations and kind of like educate basically education through porn so um so yeah that was that series and then uh, uh previous to that um I was uh, a creator uh, of a BBC Earth show, so so it was around going to extreme locations. Um, oh, cool! It, it was called Mission Selfie, uh, so it's a terrible <laughs> name. Apologies, for that. <laughs> but it was to take a selfie in extreme locations that you've never seen before. And so, but again, it was trying to turn mm-hmm. what was a selfie, maybe a, a photo. Hey, I'm going to go out for a party instead. You mm-hmm. know what? Why don't you go out with your friends? Go to mm-hmm. Iceland or or go somewhere else and, and really take a unique photo. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a memory that you're going to be able to share for the rest of your life. And so it was nice. always trying to think about, you know, those kind of platforms, whether it's Instagram mm-hmm. you know, or YouTube or anything else and, and creating something that I think hopefully uh, stories that resonate uh, better with, with the fans uh, on the platform. And so MGM, you know, came to us and said, wow, you, you guys are really doing something different, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. And you're always creating your own shows. Um, what would you be able to do? Uh, would you ever want to work with us with maybe something that we're doing? And, so cool. um, you know, there were conversations from everything from like Weekend at Bernie's. I think that was the, the <laughs> one that really threw me. I, I wasn't sure how, how you could do that one um, to to Stargate. And and so we, yeah, we jumped at the opportunity um, and we started um, thinking, okay, well, what would, you know, what would fans of Stargate want if there was a Stargate command, you know, app and mm-hmm. website uh, you know, how would that look? And so, so yeah, we, we eventually became the uh, content team um, for that. That's nice. so cool. Yeah. I think, I think I actually joined that very briefly. Um, I did. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I, I had no idea what it was, I think, but I, but I, I just was like, I wanted more Stargate things. Like that's basically, yeah, yeah. you know, I think everybody that's a Stargate fan just wants more Stargate things because, you know, it's, yeah. It's it's been a while, but there you know there was so much, but we all just want more. Like, well, yeah, I remember yeah. I remember when I first heard about Stargate Command back in like one of my friends actually, um, the guy who originally got me onto Stargate was like, oh, "There's this new like thing. I don't know what it really is." <laughs> so I remember I got it, and I was like, it, because it was so different, and I didn't really yeah. quite know what to do with it at the time. But I was like, okay, this is cool, but where do we go? What, what, what's the, what's the end game here? But it's cool now hearing from your process, like what was being built into that or what the intention was for it, um, which I, is really cool. I really like the approach and everything you were talking about, about, you know, leaning into new, uh, new media and social media, um, as opposed to trying to fight against it. And it just, the whole time you were talking about that, it made me think of, um, Ridley Scott's recent comments about how, um, phones ha- phones killed his uh, revenue on his most recent movie. Um, and it's like, well, did they? Or is it just like not changing with the times and not learning yeah. how to adapt? Um, like no no shade to Ridley Scott, who's an amazing director. <laughs> right, right. But, but like, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of that resistance to, to what is just naturally happening versus just going with it and trying to embrace it and trying to, to figure out. And, you know, sometimes you, you come up with really out there ideas for it, but you know, you, you can get farther that way. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Totally. Um, and I mean, I would say with, with Stargate command, um, we definitely came into the project, um, uh, later. So there were lots of people, lots of great people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe three, four, five agencies kind of mm -hmm. like all working on it at the same time. And so, um, so yeah, we were sort of the kind of end latter half, um, maybe not even half, latter quarter, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, as Stargate Command started making more and more um, like documentaries mm -hmm. uh, and long form content. That's, that's kind of around that era that, that we joined. Um, cool. Unfortunately, we have so much amazing footage. In mm -hmm. fact, we even have a table read that had that kind of animation style um, mm -hmm. of a script of Stargate Extinction. That was the Stargate uh, Atlantis um, continuation Oh. Uh, that was uh, sadly um, canceled when MGM went bankrupt. So that's mm -hmm. so, so that project. I mean, kind of Stargate AI and mm -hmm. that style and what we've been thinking about. I mean, that that's been a probably a three four year process. Um, you know, we've never released it because uh, it is it is very murky, I guess, in terms of who owns it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and we of course want to partner with with MGM and, and be very supportive of new stargate so so yeah we don't we don't just release stuff but right i'm really glad we had an opportunity to kind of recreate at least the 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 style and the art direction and, and really actually go in a, a bolder direction um, yeah. than that original that original project that's so cool so so i mean i've so i read a little bit and i actually saw a video interview of you like as you were about to launch the the kickstarter for the companion uh, but, yeah yeah um, can you tell us about the transition from Stargate Command to what ha what became the Companion? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Stargate Command was um, going to be, and it was the biggest project that we ever had as a company, and we basically our entire company was going to become effectively this MGM uh, <laughs> machine. Um, and unfortunately it got canceled, uh, mm -hmm. coupled with, with COVID. And so we, um, I remember we were in the office. It was like the last week effectively. Mm. And, and we basically said either we can shut down, which is totally viable. Right. Or we can try and do this ourselves is completely separately. Right. And, um, obviously we chose the latter, mm -hmm. uh, path. And, um, you know, and, and the thing that was, um, you know, for us, that was most exciting, I guess, is uh, as much as we, you know, love working with MGM, you still always have to have a film studio filter, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, with us, if you can kind of remain independent and you start going down a much more documentary and journalism path, then you can, you know, you can tell actually different types of stories that you wouldn't be able to if it was, you know, kind of officially branded and, and through, right. um, through studio. And so that's probably like where the excitement kind of came from and, and wondering what, you know, what we could do. Um, cool. And so, so yeah, that Kickstarter was really um, a combination of obviously we needed support, but also, hey, let's see if there, there is, you know, what kind of, um, love or, or idea, you know, or what kind of fans might be interested in this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I would say, I mean, even though the Kickstarter was successful, I would probably say we learned a lot. And I think what I learned was, um, you know, we needed to, well, it was just really hard to describe like what we, what we were, you know, and, and what mm -hmm. we were trying to deliver. And I think it's even still hard now. I mean, the best way I could describe it now is we're, we're an online, you know, sci-fi magazine and, and podcasting, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. platform. Um, but yeah, actually we want to be so much more. I, I think that's the thing that's hard to describe because it doesn't, it doesn't actually exist. Uh, what's, what's sort of in my mind in terms of what we're going to be building. So, yeah. So what is that? Like where, cause we, that was part of our dialogue we wanted to kind of have with you is like, we totally see where you're at now. Um, and it was, but obviously you can tell you're still like exploring and pushing your boundaries. Cause I was playing around a little bit on the site because also then I like went down some rabbit holes and like I found like the quizzes and I found the like the Wraith exploratory game and I found all yeah. these other things and I was like well there's so much other stuff happening here um 
beyond just that documentary feel and beyond just the podcast. So where, where do you see it? Like, what's your, what's your vision here? Where is it yeah, going? Yeah. You know, so, so in, interestingly, I, I don't think I ever needed or wanted to necessarily create, let's say a content platform. I don't think that right. was a thing. I, I like content. And I think when it comes to, um, you know, telling these stories, um, you know, that's how fans connect. That's how we connect with uh, the creators, you know, the cast and the crew. So for sure. But for me, it's, it really is just the community, uh, number mm-hmm. one. Um, I think some people probably think, and they're probably annoyed that we have a paywall. Um, I promise you, this is not a money grab or a... It's not a high paywall. <laughs> it's it is not. not. Yeah, it is very low. Uh, <laughs> it, it could barely buy us a cup of coffee on uh, you know, most <laughs> months, not days. Um, but what's what's actually interesting about it, and and, and I would love to hear your perspectives uh, uh, on the platform, there isn't any negativity. That's the one thing mm-hmm. that I was really hoping that a tiny paywall would do. It keeps all of the... Mm. toxicity and jerks out mm. um and obviously it has all the other benefits of being ad free uh, and everything you know um free of sponsorship and, and independence effectively um mm. yeah like you know on our trailer um that ign put out lots of haters <laughs> um mm. in my inbox lots of haters but that's because all of those things are are free and anyone can reach out to us uh for some reason for a buck two bucks it gets really hard for for people to come in. I think we've had like one or two negative comments on the site mm-hmm. in total uh, out of out of like twenty thousand comments, you know, that we've had. So, um, so yeah, that that's uh, the reason why is because um. So so my wife, uh, mm-hmm. she used to be a professional uh, gamer, professional esports player, oh, cool. and um and, and then mm-hmm. she worked in community management. Um, for the Batman video games. And then now she works uh, in PR uh, for Sega. Um, but yeah, when she was a, a gamer, you can still see these YouTube videos out there. And and some of the comments are really horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It is a, you know, it's a very toxic. I, I, can, I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Oh. It's so, so interesting to think, mm-hmm. sorry, but just yeah. a small paywall, like, because when people want to be jerks, like they can leave a comment for free on a YouTube video, but it's like the second yeah. you put up even a, a two dollar paywall, they can't be bothered. So I can see that's so interesting. Just like two bucks keeps yeah. the ears away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and if you ever um you know support creators on Patreon, you know, mm-hmm. the, the Patreon mm-hmm. community tends to be really, really lovely and really nice. And so um, yeah, so that it's the same kind of um theory i had when i was seeing that and, and i was like okay yeah if, if if you don't make it free so not anyone can enter you just need some kind of like filter of nice people and mm. so i think there's a combination of okay let's make sure um we have a little bit of a paywall and then number two um uh let's bring in to be honest um women that was like huge mm-hmm. for me i mean it was really so my wife's name is sarah uh, also oh. so <laughs> i was just thinking about sarah like okay how do we create a place for sarah to be able to go and mm-hmm. if we bring in other women <clears throat> you would be able to um well, hopefully uh, women tend to be nicer i think uh, n- not that men are <laughs> not nice um and so the the amanda's uh, live stream with um you know uh, uplifting women um in film and television was like the perfect vehicle to do that. Um, and so, so yeah, um, lovely so cool. members like yourself joined. And yeah. I think that's actually what's made it, you know, made the companion so great. So, so thank you. Thank you. Of course. That. I mean, that was, that was that one video or that one interview and, and her pushing it forward, you know, it was the whole reason I, I knew about the companion at all, but yeah. then, but then I got there and listened to that, watched that entire video live. I've watched it since as well. And then, you know, you put out like the best quotes. Cause I was like frantically trying to write down my <laughs> right. favorite quotes of hers during that thing, because there are just so many amazing um, yeah. ideas that she brought forth as you know, somebody behind the camera to give you some context. I just directed my first feature film last December. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a story about a non-binary person. And it's, um, as far as the set that we ran, we tried to keep it very inclusive, um, and very tight knit also because it was in the middle of COVID, but, um, just all these ideas of, of respecting the crew and respecting people and accepting people and being inclusive. And then to, to hear somebody like Amanda Tapping, who, 
you know, is working in the industry, but also like pushing forward those same ideas. It was just amazing to get that in that one video and then to, to be like, oh, let me look at the rest of the content on this site. And there are deep dive articles about really fascinating subjects. Um, I mean, it's totally worth what, $2 a month or whatever it <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah. Like, it's just yeah. the price point is it more than it, it to me, it's more than worth it. Well, oh, and great, I have great. I have to give you a little bit of a compliment on this, Lawrence. So my first, so I joined in on the campaign shortly before the AI read because I was like, well, I want to be a part of it. And so when I jumped in the Discord, um, there was something because we were going back and forth. You and I, I had like a commentary, and there was something I said, and I don't even I should have looked it up, but your immediate response was because something about how said, like I was. But what was it? But, I, but it's a woman, like we were talking about the podcast. You're like, but it's it's a female-led podcast. Yes. And, and you, go ahead. I forget what it was you said back, but the way you said it was so affirming that <laughs> I didn't even realize that I had oh, yeah, yeah, but, done it to myself. And I was like, yeah. I'm sold in that. Yeah. Like I was already sold, but when you did that, because it wasn't, because here's two things. You can go long form with it and you can have this like, okay, we need to make sure we're inclusive. We need to make sure we do that. But you can run that through an editor. You can run through it. But your initial gut reaction to just be super on it, that told me right then and there everything I needed to know about like about companion, about all of what it is that you're trying to do. Right, right. And it made me feel super welcome. So mission accomplished a thousand <laughs> oh, cool. times over. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's who you yeah. were. It came through right away. And I was like, wow, that's so awesome because we tackle this a lot in our kind of world of it and the three of us um and we are mostly reside within tiktok that's where our creation came from and our collaboration and we've had to really band together i was about to say speaking of terrible comments i mean because that's yeah. where we it runs rampant but we've got that core group and so to create a place where we all felt like cool we can jump over here and feel really safe and have these like discord conversations jump in and know we're amongst people that are safe and aren't gatekeeping and aren't you know kind of pulling all these just yeah, nasty comments you mean, on there. It's, yeah, it's yeah. so I appreciate you for that. So thank you so oh, much no, no, for laying that you. foundation. Yeah, no, thank you for for commenting and yeah. yeah I mean, I think it's awesome what what um, the three of you are doing um, on this podcast and everything else. So so kudos and keep going and and let us know how we can keep sharing your podcast. <laughs> obviously in that Discord and everything else. So I'm very awesome. happy to do that. So I love it. Okay, so we do have some Stargate questions for you. Sure, sure. <laughs> This is kind of a general, yeah. like, like backstory question. Like, <laughs> how did, what is your, how did your interest in science fiction evolve? Like, what is your kind of your origin story, <laughs> if you would say, <laughs> of like, like little baby oh. Lawrence and, and how did yeah. you, who you are now? You know, so um, it's weird. I, I don't know if I would. Um, call myself like let's call it as a sci-fi fan if you will. I don't know if anyone does I mean I guess I guess there are some people that do that but you know I just tended to gravitate towards films and shows that dealt with these kinds of you know space science I remember when I was a kid uh, my mom always tried to get me to read and then I hated reading <laughs> and I was like no 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 I'm not gonna read and one day I said no no, no okay this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna write instead mm. and so I end up writing a couple of pages. I mean, you know, I was quite young, but I remember it was called the Stinger, and it was like this, you know, dark city, cool. and there was this serp, uh, this uh, scorpion-like stinger that was, you know, stinging people, and and uh, <laughs> uh, and so, so yeah, somehow it just always kind of turned into to stories like that, That's and cool. so so yeah, I mean, I, I like all stories, um, but um, but yeah, it just happens to sometimes be, you know uh science fiction and and uh uh and you know my favorite book is uh slaughterhouse five um and yeah i, I genuinely didn't think about it from a science fiction perspective a, at all but it, it's completely shaped uh in so many ways my life and and the way i i treat other people and the relationships i create um with new people that i meet um um yeah I, I don't know if, if you've all read slaughterhouse five or, or know what i'm so it about. goes have not. so it goes yeah mm -hmm. um, um actually my <laughs> i get to throw a bonnie story in here um oh, bonnie so bonnie is my mother and okay <laughs> anyway like we literally 30 minutes before this recording we were having dinner and um i brought up well so i i actually had brought up the fact that the the total recall um article that um Philip K. Day's wife 
wrote, which oh, yeah. was amazing. Yeah, Tessa, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. And um, she was like, she was like, now Philip K. Dick, who blah, blah, blah. And at some point I, I got into the whole, um, well, Philip K. Dick and Vonnegut like occupy the same space for me. Like in, in my mind, mm -hmm. I've read tons of both of them. Um, and she was like, well, I, 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 be, I keep meaning to read. I keep meaning to read some Vonnegut. And I, she's like, I just don't know which one. I'm like, just go for Slaughterhouse Five. Like, just yeah, go. Yeah. It's the most accessible. It's it's what everybody, you know, that's the one that you read if you're only going to read one, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a total that's tangent. So I'm sorry. But it just yeah. like it had been brought up literally 30 minutes. But it was because of the Total Recall article, which was That's so fantastic cool. like i loved reading that from beginning to end <laughs> oh cool yeah i mean one one theme that i've pulled out from slaughterhouse five so i don't think it's going to spoil anything or, or give anything <laughs> no. away um to sarah you're, you're safe you sorry can still read the book. no not at all but um so so i've oftentimes when i meet new people um sometimes i'm really nice to them and some you know um some of my best friends i'll, I'll meet them one time and then you know i'll go to their birthday parties or whatever it is and they always say Oh, like, how come you're so into this? Or how come we're, you know, why, why did you even come to my birthday? I was, I kind of invited you, but I didn't really think you were going to come like a coworker. And, uh, and I don't know if this is the right kind of takeaway, uh, specifically from this, but um, <laughs> the Tremalfadorians, they are an alien race that comes up quite a lot in Philip K. Dick's uh, books from time to time. And they sort of get represented in different ways. But um, th this book in particular, uh, it's sort of a nonlinear uh, book so he kind of jumps around a lot and there's a reason why but I but we won't get, get into that necessarily um, but at one point about midway through the book um, uh, he tries to learn or I guess the aliens uh, they try to teach him you know um, well, why is effectively your story this way well, why is it why is it going around and he said well humans aren't smart enough um, to be able to understand it so the best way we can kind of mm -hmm. describe it is imagine your life as a like a mountain range Mm -hmm. And there's peaks and valleys. And so, you know, birthday parties are happy and peaks and, you know, other things, sad moments are, are valleys and you up and mm -hmm. down. Now, humans can only kind of look at things by going up and down a mountain. But with us, the best way to describe it, I guess, is we're on a different mountain range. And so, therefore, we can see all of the peaks and valleys. And so you can jump in and you can jump out at any mm -hmm. given point to experience the highs and lows. And you need them in order to have a, a, a full life. So I remember reading that and I thought, um, oh, okay, so we're not smart enough to be able to see like our own futures, but mm -hmm. we can imagine it, uh, you know, with some kind of positive thinking. And so sometimes when I meet people, I think, well, if I was a Jamal Fedorian and I was able to like sit on this other mountain range <laughs> and, 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 and it happened to be Sarah, my wife, and I can see, I can, I can vision, envision we're 90 years old and, you know, we're, we're in a cabin and, you know, maybe we're ill, maybe it's our last days together. And I just think, ah, had I known, I would have actually had a few more uh, peaks and valleys with her. Mm -hmm. So why don't I do that and invest into it now? I can create those peaks. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, I, if, if these friends of mine, you know, these people that I just met, but I think, you know what, they're good people. And I think I'm going to be friends with them. How do I extend the time? And I can never extend the mountain range. I can't extend my life. But what I could do is I can start earlier and, and be nicer and be friendlier. Um, that's one way of controlling it. So it's like a really bizarre, I think, way of kind of describing it. But that's how that book uh, made me think. I love a bit that. So, so, um, so yeah, I encourage you to read it. It's it's not too that's long. Awesome. As well. Okay, it's not long at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, like maybe 150 pages. Or something. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I I love cool. the way that you kind of described it. It's like not really a fan of science fiction in general, but just good stories. And that's I'm all about that and whether they tend to be more towards science fiction or whatever genre they fall into like don't box yourself into a genre and be like i'm just a sci-fi nerd or i'm just a whatever nerd like i'm just a good story nerd i want good <laughs> stories in all shapes and forms whether it's books or movies or television shows or or whatever so yeah, i love the yeah. way that you look at that that's awesome yeah 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 so um and, and i can't wait for i think podcasting and audio um it hasn't been very popular in the U.S. Um, I mean, it was it was about sixty years ago, you know, radio dramas, and it kind of mm -hmm, went away. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But in the U.K., at least, the BBC they've continuously invested into it. You still get like Doctor Who radio dramas, um, particularly yes. in the '90s when there's no Doctor Who, and so 
Um, there's some great companies out there like Realm and Q Code. And they're investing into drama and they're investing into science fiction and fantasy, um, you know, podcasts. Um, Molly, uh, the founder of Realm, she's super awesome. And, and one of the um, uh, shows that they produce, um, Control, Alt, Destroy, I think, um, hmm. features Summer Glau. Uh, who um, oh. is River Tam in in, in Fire uh, Fire? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she does the kind of one of the main character. And so, yeah, I think there's like a whole, you know, open, you know, opportunity and world to be able to go beyond effectively just audiobooks, but into these kind of podcast dramas, radio dramas, um, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah. I think there's the that that's really exciting to me. You know, over the next few years. I think that's super cool. Do you envision a lot of that circling back to the question around like companion and where you're trying to go and like what that's going to be? Do you, I know you said you don't view it as like a place for like content creation per se, but I could see a lot of that living within that space. Like a lot of this like homegrown drama related conversations or like all these dialogues, like I feel like the group within the companion, I feel like there's a lot of creation space for those places to live or to exist or kind of house themselves. Yeah, yeah, I totally. Know. I mean, the the reason why I kind of said I don't necessarily see it as content, it was it was really just trying to say, um, I actually just hope it's it's a wonderful community. Um, yeah. I, I would love a million fans um, to be able to, you know, live amongst themselves, I suppose, you know, little pockets mm -hmm. uh, of their own fandoms and, and uh, effectively celebrate and uplift. Um, and, you know, even debate, you know, the themes, um, mm -hmm. just, just like, you know, mm -hmm. sharing what I thought about Slaughterhouse-Five. So, th so thank mm -hmm. you for letting me do that. Um, and, and of course, the product that we'll be producing, as in just our conversation, will be content. And hopefully somebody yeah. will then be able to enjoy it and then comment and interact with it. And then we can interact with them. And so, so yeah, naturally, there's just going to be content, I think, being created. But I think unlike... Um, uh, you know, exactly like uh, Rebecca's, you know, Ridley Scott comment. It's like, <laughs> no, if you think about it as a conversation first or a conversation driver first and not like, let's say a film or something else, then then you actually open yourself up to to be able to do that. If you think about it as a totally different medium that tends to be one one way or one direction, then it becomes very hard to actually have a, a conversation because it's not really built for that. So um, not dodging your question at all. Uh, no, we're no, still okay. completely... Um, you know, really focused on just keep testing and experimenting. And honestly, um, I don't, I don't know if members realize how much influence they have um, because mm -hmm. there's such a small minority that speak to us. We literally make what members tell us to make or, or ask <laughs> us to make, you know, uh, or at least we have to kind of gauge like, Oh, I think this is what they're kind of saying or what they would yeah. want. And so uh, the next thing that's coming out that I think is gonna be really exciting is our uh, Richard Dean Anderson uh, conversations in sci-fi with with Brad. Um, oh, cool. um, I actually it, it's it's been filmed um, and yeah. I've been reviewing yeah. it. Yeah, I've it, been reviewing it. So so it's happening. Hearing about Richard Dean Anderson coming onto the companion just makes me feel like Jack O'Neill in Heroes and like nobody's like the guy can't get him to talk to him this whole time. Then all of a sudden, by, finally by the end, he, he sits he sits down because Hammond tells him he has to. And like, I just keep getting that feeling every time I see something about that Richard Dean Anderson interview. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's so wonderful and lovely. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're, we're we'll probably, um, yeah, no, it, it, so what we'll probably end up doing is creating a couple of um, like clips and things like that. We'll, we'll think about how, if we can turn it into a little bit of a live event, I'm not really sure because because it was sort of a, a podcast just like this. Yeah. But, you know, last time Stargate AI was was really fun. Um, and so, so yeah, if members and fans are, are into it, then, then maybe doing another event like that and we can all hang out and, and watch it together uh that'd be really that'd be really cool i think essentially being able to turn it into a watch party and this this idea that you talk about about the community of of the app is kind of like to me it's kind of like trying to to recreate that feeling that you get like at a convention or something mm -hmm. where you're you have this space that's like everybody around you is is like into the same thing and you want to have those those conversations and yeah you're here because like you're watching the one famous person on stage or whatever and that's cool and like that's amazing to get that but then you also are able to have all those interactions so like a, a watch party sort of situation feels 
a lot like what you're trying to what you're talking about and like how how you want it to go like that yeah sort of thing. yeah completely and um I, I don't know if you have ever been on the companion and from time to time brad just starts commenting on people's like comments <laughs> um as a member I mean, literally <laughs> i and love it this one con this concept that we had earlier this is before we launched and um uh, i was getting some advice um from um, a magazine editor and i was asking um rosie she, she was the editor of um she still is a, a den of geek over here in the UK. Oh, yeah. And, and I was saying, Oh yeah. So, you know, I want to do this conference. I want to host a conference and I want to get, um, uh, Dave Golder, who is an editor of SFX magazine and some fans together, et cetera. Like I want to get them all together and start talking about science fiction and really just talk about themes like blah, 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 you know, whatever it was, doesn't yeah. really matter. And, um, and, and she said, she stopped me. She said, well, hold on, hold on a second. Why do you keep saying conference? And I was like, oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I, I really meant uh, a convention. That's, that's really what I meant. Hmm. She's like, no, 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 I don't think so. I think you meant conference. And it, it feels like it's something different. Um, you know, and I, and I realized, yeah, a conference, typically speaking, is when you go somewhere, and it doesn't matter if you're a producer or you're the director or you're an actor or you're a screenwriter or anything. Mm -hmm. Everyone's on an equal level, level, you know, level playing field. And you're just trying to get films made or you're trying to get mm -hmm. business done. Mm -hmm. A convention actually has like a little bit of a, you know, stars on a pedestal and then sort of like everyone else. Right. And, you know, what I was trying to describe was um, if we were to talk about time travel or Slaughterhouse Five and this theme, mm -hmm. none of us know time travel. Sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> like if you work at, um, you know, if you're an engineer or you're a science fiction writer or you're a 17 year old fan, um, none of us is traveling the time. Like, like right. we're sort so of we're all, all equal just, here. Yeah. yeah. And, and so actually it should be more like a conference or what we later called it a summit. That's what it is. It's, it's talking awesome. about interesting things. And so, um, so yeah, if we ever do anything like that, if we ever do anything live, like a convention, I would love a more conference or summit like experience. How cool would it be Agreed. if there was 12 people sitting around in a circle and it's the three of you and myself and Amanda and Brad, and, <laughs> you know, and let's talk about time travel. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what are your favorite time travel films or shows? Yeah. You know, what are the 10 different types of time travel? Because they're all sort of different, you know, mm -hmm. like the grandfather paradoxes or not. And, you know, and, and so, but like, who's an authority on it? Like no one, we're all, we're all equal. So that would be an interesting conversation. That's like the yeah. you know, five five dinner guests, you know, yep. dinner alive kind of question that that I, I think I've always wanted to recreate, and, and hopefully other other members uh, would would love that as well. I would be I so down with that. That's for real. such an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah, because yeah, it's so, like yeah, you all have such differences, but yeah, you find that one common where we're all like, yeah, nope, but we're all idiots on this, but we have opinions, yeah, yeah, so let's yeah, just yeah. all just dive in. We're all think, dumb leaves with opinions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's what science fiction is, right? I mean, other than yeah. obviously, yeah. say, Brad being an accomplished writer or Amanda being an actress and, and now producer director, um, but yeah. those are like the technical skills. I mean, I mean, and when it comes to the science, when it comes to, you know, the, the stories and, and, and the themes, um, you know, no one really is an expert. We're all, we're all equal here and, and trying to get as much as we can out of it. So. Well, and I think yeah. the community thrives off of that kind of approach or would thrive on it just from our little bit of dabbling in how we've, because our, how we came together was all just very organically through our TikTok, through just sharing a fandom and a passion. And then it kind of, the way our, my experience with the fandom nowadays is very much community-based. Like everyone's like, we need to be in this together, have a conversation. It's very opinion-based, very conversational. Um, but the hierarchy doesn't stand well within the, like what I feel, not just Stargate, but just in general, the community now, people are like, we got to band together. We got to keep this alive. We got to keep the passion, the creativity. Um, and we all just kind of come as we are. And so I feel like if that's a mindset going forward, it really helps keep kind of, this mindset of companion and growth, literally companion together, like being part of one. But the minute it starts to hierarchy, I think it just feels like we're going backwards as a society, backwards as how we handle, you know, community or growth and conversations. And I think that's where things might, I would project that to fail. Like I would not want to be involved in that because I don't want to feel distance between me and someone else. I want to be at the table having an honest dialogue. So yeah, I, would be so I mean, if you just the, 
the people that the people that listen to us are mostly a lot of the, those people that actually brought us together and and were the ones yeah. that were like, hey, can you guys make a podcast? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean that that was all that community and that like togetherness that did that did that. So it was pretty. Yeah, pretty, that's awesome. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really cool. really cool. It's cool to like also cross paths like so like hopping on for the AI script read and just being in the chat. There's so many people that were crossover like, oh hey, hey, you're here. Hey, you're here. Hey, wait, yeah. Where? Oh wait, good to see you. And it's like, oh hi everybody, like group virtual hug. Um, and I loved that. And so going back to the, you know, RDA like that read. If it was some sort of live like watch party, I would be so cool because I think everyone would band together and be like, oh, you guys gonna hop on? Let's watch this. And it would just help bring everyone together. But if you just release it in silos and everybody's just by themselves watching, it's not as exciting. You know, it's just like yeah. it doesn't bring that. It's not the same feel. Yeah, no, no, there, there's a, I, I just, um, I love, I mean, some, I think some members, um, we have had feedback, it, it almost like stresses them out, because there's so many comments that kind of fly oh, no. through. Yeah, but, but, um, but I love it, you know, personally, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep track or, or mm -hmm. when there's like questions kind of going through, and I'm trying to find them. And every time I scroll somewhere, it, it, it kind of get, you know, gets pushed again. I was like, Oh, you know, but I don't mind that. Uh, I love it. Uh, I think it's. I think it's so. The energy is is so incredible. So so love that. I'm um, I'm gonna bring this concept back around and and t tie in this other question that I had. Um, sure. So kind of take it back to the '90s. Um, so uh, I heard in that same video interview with you um, the idea of the X Files specifically, but also '90s. Yes. A lot of '90s shows in general basically heralding this this like idea of using social media and chat rooms and everything um as a way for fans to interact and and to like have that voice um and i guess uh my question uh, so so the question i had written down was do you think that's why 90s era sci-fi and television in general has such a distinct place in so many people so many people's hearts and minds um and is is this kind of like what we have now with a lot of these like with discord and with the companion and things like that is that kind of like that um that kind of resurgence of that kind of that 90s like chat room feeling that you had when you went to talk about what Mulder and Scully did on Sunday like in the most recent episode of the X-Files <laughs> um yeah that's interesting i i definitely think um, well, I definitely think what Netflix did in terms of, you know, bulk dropping and binge viewing, that kind of behavior uh, has been amazing. But I also think what it did was it kind of killed conversation in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. people are on different paths and different schedules. And um, as an example, one of the technologies uh, I was working on, I, I've kind of put a pin in it for, for the moment, is... I would love if the companion can listen and understand mm -hmm. what you're uh, watching as an example. So mm -hmm. let's say Hawkeye is, you know, is on and then it would ping you and it would say, Hey, there are 500 other members literally watching this around now. Oh, would you cool. like to join a chat room with them when it's over? Nice. Mm. And then you jump in and you get to chat about it. Uh, the technology is all there. It's very possible. It's just, um, you know, a very similar Alexa listening kind of technology. And then you just jump someone into a Discord or Zoom type environment. Um, I just don't know if like people would use it. It didn't seem like, I mean, it, it sounds like cool, like in concept, but um, uh, that's like, as an example, one thing that, um, that I thought about. And so mm -hmm. the reason why, so again, that's a community driven idea. It's not content. I, I don't, you know, I don't think. Mm -mm. Um, but oh yeah, and I should probably mention that's the reason why we also called it the companion. All I'm, I'm all I'm ever doing is thinking. Look, the fans, the cast, the crew, the show, the stories. Those are the heroes. How do we support that connection? And so, so we're your companion, and everyone's companion can have, you know, everyone can have their own kind of unique companion experience. Um, we, yeah, I mean, I, I think most of the team members. I think I don't think most people know who anyone's names are because I, I don't know of how important that is um hmm. to me the the importance is um but either the journalists obviously who are writing or the the content creators um yeah like I, I don't need to be famous I think most of our team members um feel the same way it's it's how do we how do we you know 
how to become your companions effectively you know, in the best way possible. So, so yeah, that's a, that's an idea that that I've had. Um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm always on message boards and I'm always listening, and people find it really challenging to know is Stargate on, and oh no, it's not on Hulu anymore, and is it going to be on mm-hmm. Amazon? And I've actually been wanting to write an article um, for months now. I just haven't had the time on really explaining. Uh, I haven't spoken to MGM, uh, you know, at all about this, but. I have a feeling this is what they're doing, and this is the reason why things are coming off streaming platforms mm-hmm. and the timeline on like what you, you what you can expect, um, um, just in general, like on how how the industry works. Because I think, um, I mean, there was like another really big um, controversy around Star Trek Discovery, right? It, it being mm-hmm. pulled, um, you know, everywhere else, uh, or at least in the UK for sure. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so as we as we go into our next franchises, Star Trek is going to be another key one that we'll be doing the same mm-hmm. way that we're going to be working, you know, um, that we have and, and we'll continue to do a Stargate. Uh, hopefully we'll learn more and more uh, and, you know, get to meet um, folks at Paramount and understand their strategies as well. So, so yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's one thing. I We, I was... we get, especially when we go live on TikTok, uh, usually every 20 minutes or so, somebody asking about what do we think, is happening with Stargate and like yeah. the future of Stargate. Um, interestingly, it is not off of Netflix. Like it said, it was going to be, it's not Ooh. right now. So it's still mm. on Netflix. Um, and cause they said it was going to be off by December 1st and now it's December 5th and we still have it. So oh, yeah. jinx it. Don't yeah. jinx it. <laughs> I have, I'm on season eight of my rewatch. Don't jinx it. I need to go a little bit longer because I own um, all of Atlantis, but not SG one. So. Yeah. yeah. So it just, it seems to be definitely, it, I mean, it seems to be a moment in time of a, you know, t- as Sarah says um, all the time in our episodes, spoiler alert for a 20 year old TV show, but like a 20 year old TV show, yeah. but like it, it's, it's a, people want it. They seem to want it. They, they ask about it all the time. Uh, yeah. It is the number one question we get on our lives. Um, which is like, we don't know, we're not attached to anything, but like, we yeah. can, we can guess, we can make, you know, educated guesses. And, um, they also ask like, what, what do you, what do you think? What do you, what would you like it to be? You know, if like a new Stargate came out, what would it be? So I guess maybe what would it be for you if a new Stargate came out? Um, so I, I'm not, I might not answer that. Um, Fair enough. You don't have to. But the reason why <laughs> is because um, I've actually read the pilot. Uh, I'm one of mm. the few people that I have. So the original idea with Stargate AI mm-hmm. uh, was not AI necessarily. Um, when we're speaking to Brad, um, you know, it was, there was the original kind of script that um, uh, Joseph Malazzi wrote with Stargate Extinction. Mm-hmm. And we said, you know, we know you've been working with, with MGM could we do the same thing, you know, or maybe even just a few scenes, but with um, your pilot script? Mm. He's like, yeah, let's do it. Wow. And so, mm. you know, we, we um, you know, spoke to MGM. Um, they were really into it. Um, what we didn't know, obviously, was the Amazon uh, yeah. <laughs> purchase that was looming. So, so I kind of yeah. wish we could have saved some time and not had like four meetings on, on, on this. But um oh. Um, but yeah, no, that was the kind of original idea. It would have been been really great. And um, but everything Brad talks about in his podcasts, I would mm-hmm. say, are absolutely true. So I'll, I'll just repeat those things, which is, <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> um, you know, the the um, you know, you gotta you gotta start moving Stargate forward. I mean, why mm-hmm. Stargate was so magical wasn't because it was talking about a team or Stargate in the past. And it mm-hmm. wasn't talking about a Stargate in the future. It was always because it's the science fiction for today. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think sometimes with fans, they want to know what happened uh, with Eli and, and, you know, the Destiny crew or right. where's Sam and Jack. And totally, like, that's not to say you shouldn't be answering them, those questions. But we do have to imagine what it would be like in 2023, right? Or 2025, if the show mm-hmm. comes out, or, or in his case, mm-hmm. maybe it was 2021. And... um Therefore, you wouldn't have, you know, 50, 60, or in like Jack O'Neill's case, like 70 year old Jack O'Neill running around. <laughs> no, um, right. Oh, God, you know, let him retire. Kind of right, right, right. <laughs> Please let um, him. Right. You're going to have to bring in, you know, uh, potentially new teams, but that doesn't mean that 
you know, say a Rodney or a, a Sam wouldn't be leading, you know, science mm. departments or teams or, or anything like that. And so without a doubt, you're going to have to have a connection, you know, to the core IP uh, and the core team. But, but actually, um, you know, what's amazing about science fiction is we imagine, you know, kind, kind of what's possible, like in the future or the near future. So, so, so try not to, you know, think about the past. I think it's about moving I, it forward. Really. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's ultimately what we all end up saying to people too. And what we think would be the most natural progression for Stargate is, you know, that idea that you, you have to have the, like, you have to have those moments that like satisfy people for like, for what they've already seen and the characters that they love, but it's good. It, it needs to move forward and would much rather have that as a continuation rather than trying to reboot something. Um, right. I feel like that would be a, a tragedy if, if, if a reboot yeah. versus a, versus a continuation happened. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, so, so I love, uh, I actually love all, all Stargates, including universe and, <laughs> and Atlantis. I know there's a lot of fans that don't like universe, but um, even just taking like say Stargate Atlantis, which is a bit more beloved, I think amongst mm -hmm. all, all of the fan base, totally different team different personalities like love it like um mm -hmm. i i even i think i even prefer maybe stargate atlantis or a lot of the episodes mm -hmm. at least on um, 2sg1 and um and so i think that's the kind of thing that you would you would want to go into with a new series yeah, um yeah i don't think you would want well i think some fans would want the old sg1 team but i'm sure <laughs> the writers wouldn't want to do that you know um they've got to come up with new stories and and um you know, how does social media get baked into it? I, I think that's the one thing I loved about Stargate Universe, which is kind of weird, how mm -hmm. Eli was chosen through playing because of the video uh, game. Of him, MMO. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and it's like, whoa, like who thought of that? And then Kino, um, mm -hmm. the little, basically it was a flying vlog cam, you know? Yeah. Uh, we're just trying to get to that technology right now. And so, yeah, to me, it was like uh, such forward thinking for the era that it came out. Uh, vlogging was not a thing. And yet, kinos existed you know um, yeah mm -hmm. and so um yeah that that's i think that's what's the brilliance of of the of the stargate writers and, and really just sci-fi writers in general that they're they're thinking about okay what what does it look like a few years from now not not kind of like what it looks like you know 10 years ago so something we've talked about a lot and many times i'm sure we'll bring it up again but is the kind of fact or thought that people lament current science fiction being too woke or politicized and it's too much this it's too much like they're taking stuff from social media or what's going on in you know current affairs and they're jamming it into science fiction to which i say where have you been because that's always what science fiction has been but rebecca brought up if we do get a new stargate expect it to be like an updated more current like woke if you will version of it and i think it kind of has to be to be successful it can't be the same old things rehashed over and over again it has to bring something new and like you were saying about how they found him through the video game or they're they're bringing current things in and i think you know but when, when you brought that up rebecca i was like yeah and i think it might make a lot of people unhappy but you can't just keep reselling the same thing over and over again It'll all, I mean, it always has, and it always will. And like, I, I fight disco haters all day, every day <laughs> for the, those same reasons. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, um, uh, uh the, the, I think the woke debate, well, I, I not the woke debate part, but like say the politics, um, I think, um, a Working journalist, <laughs> yeah, a journalist, <laughs> Uh, William Bibiani, he said this, actually, uh, I think it might even be his pinned tweet. He said um, something along the lines of um, you don't like modern science fiction because it's politicized. It always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you've become like you've become politicized, like you mm -hmm. care about politics, but you didn't care about that as a kid because you didn't you didn't know what they were. Um, and so that's the difference. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I think that's probably um sort of my response to that which is exactly like what you're saying right sarah it's it's mm -hmm. it's always had these themes uh you just mm -hmm. realize them now you didn't realize them when you were younger um for me personally um uh, being you know an asian american immigrant parents um 
Shang Chi was a really big deal. We we mm. talked about it in one of our podcasts um, when it came out. I was really nervous for it mm. uh, before it came out, and you know there is a very um, typical thing that might happen when um, Hollywood gives I might some kind of minority a chance. It could be mm -hmm. a story about ethnic minorities or gender minorities or um, representation. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it doesn't go well, it's sometimes, Hey, we gave you your shot. Yep. Maybe you get another one in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if it didn't do well, and I remember it was coming out, I think on Labor Day weekend, which traditionally, uh, or historically has been like a really low box office period. And so actually it was like a lot of things that were kind of going against Shang-Chi that I, I was very, I was nervous about. And if it, it you know, um, and then if you kind of look at it then from a historical, well, just the previous box office numbers, Crazy mm -hmm. Rich Asians was very successful. <gasps> I love yeah. that movie. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Yeah. But it was successful for effectively a rom-com, not for yeah. Yeah. a, you know, Marvel film. Right. And so if you were to, you know, use that box office number against the budget of Shang-Chi, it would have been, uh, it would have been seen as a failure. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's like all those kind of things that uh, I remember feeling, this weird pressure almost of hmm. uh, uh, and, and worry. And then you had all those kind of clickbait websites and headlines saying like, Shang-Chi is a bus. You know, they always kind of write fake headlines before it yeah. comes out and then they delete it or whatever afterwards. Mm, yeah. Like, I'll I told you or whatever. So for me, totally like um, I, I'm super into, if you want to call it woke, but that <laughs> means more Asians are on screen, then, <laughs> then yeah, let's yeah. wake up. Um, but but really- uh, you know, my, so my brother came on the next episode after Shang-Chi came out. And I think what he said was best, which is, yeah, we probably grew up eating Chinese food. And, and you know, if you're um, a white guy, maybe you grew up eating American, you know, mm -hmm. American food. But we love Mexican and we love Vietnamese and we love, you know, Caribbean food. Mm -hmm. And if you love food in a diverse way like that, why why don't we have a diverse you know menu? of content as well. Uh, and that only surely makes it better. Right. And, and mm -hmm. by all means have pasta, like five <laughs> yeah. days a week, if you're going to get tired of it at some point. You might want a taco. Right. And, and that's, you know, and you know, and now it's available. And so for the first time we kind of have that. Well, something I actually enjoyed about actually about that movie is having this conversation with a friend of mine. Cause we, um, my fear of watching it from a Marvel lens, which I was hopeful that Marvel would not do this, is I didn't want it to lean on any of the other successes. It allowed it to live and breathe its own story. And it didn't rely on having to tag in like, you know, Iron Man or like any other thing <laughs> to like have yeah, a yeah. white hero syndrome to it. It didn't, it didn't do that. And it, it was successful in and of its own right. So I, just remember having this dialogue probably last week with a friend about it because they had just watched it for the first time. And they're like, it was so refreshing because there was no like white hero syndrome. They didn't, they're like, it just yeah. wasn't there. It it allowed all the the history and the storytelling, all of it to just truly flourish um, and just be experienced without having to explain, without having to do anything. It just allowed it to exist. And I thought it was beautiful. Um, so it's interesting bringing that up now because we'd had so that conversation. If you, from your perspective, I guess yeah. I'm assuming uh, none of you speak Chinese or, or Mandarin. No, I have no. attempted for the last five years okay. and it <laughs> failed miserably. Okay, okay. Well, now my question will make sense then, which okay. is so the way my brother described it, and I totally get what he was saying, but it but it didn't hit me while I was watching it. And when okay. I'd asked them, you know, what did you think of Shang Chi? He was sitting. You know, he, he lives in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Huge. Um, Mm. Uh, you know, African American community. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he was saying he was in the cinema, um, you know, black, white, mm -hmm. uh, they were probably the only Asians, or at least the only ones they can see. And like, for the first 10 minutes, it was Chinese. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, he, <laughs> he, and he said, Whoa, they're going there. Like, mm -hmm. let's do this. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Because we're the only ones I can, under, you know, mm -hmm. understand. And everyone else has to kind of read subtitles or or just go mm -hmm. through. And I'm I'm curious, uh, was that weird for you? Was it not? Because for me, listening to Chinese and listening to English is I, I can't tell actually the difference until like I really think about it. It's just the same thing that's input that's coming through. Um, um I for me, it felt how I wanted it to be. It felt authentic because I I need to be not forced to like listen, but it it would 
No, it wasn't weird. I, I would have felt like it was, again, whitewashed or white heroed if they flipped it, if they didn't give the Mandarin language enough time on screen. It, I mean, it, it was fine for me. I appreciated that because I'm okay. like, oh, wait, I have to read the subtitles. Okay, cool. All right, what's going on here? But it forced me to engage with it in a way that probably many other cultures have had to do the reverse of, you know, and had to read their subtitles. So it, it, it felt more authentic to me. And um, it's to like they're trusting the audience too of like, mm -hmm you guys are smart enough to, to do this. Like this, we're not going to spoon feed you this and, and make it all English just to make it easier for you. Like, we're not going to spoon feed you this information. We're going to make it real. And if that means you have three subtitles to, to experience this, how we want you to, then you have three of the subtitles. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're not no, going to spoon good. feed you this information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's important to, to have that, to have whatever, yeah. like in, in, in a broader term, like whatever language in in whatever culture that you're trying to portray or you're trying to to like that you're seeing on screen um to give an example i never watch anime with dubbed i always like it mm -hmm. subbed because i like having the language there i think it adds to it and it's an important part of the culture um and to give another interesting filmmaking story of mine i lived in korea for two years and um while I was there, I made a short film. Um, and since all of the characters were Korean in the short film, I got my Korean friend to actually, we, we wrote the script in English, but we actually tr had it translated into Korean and we shot the whole thing in Korean and then put English subtitles on it because that felt proper. And like, mm -hmm. who am I to be a white person trying to tell a story in Korean with Korean, in Korea yeah. with Korean yeah. people <laughs> in English. So it's, I, I love languages anyway, and I don't have a problem with it. But um, I think it is very important. And it also makes, reminds me of that, remember that French um, wolf attacking people movie from what, the late 90s, early 2000s? I can't remember the name of it, but it was in French. An animated movie, right? No, it was live action. Oh. Oh. And it was in French and it was like a werewolf or a wolf attacking. It's oh. based on like some, some actual historical thing that was, you know, a... Oh, I don't know. A tail. Anyway, I remember. I think, Adam's, I think Adam's giving it a goog. He's giving it a goog. Um, all of this to say that it was interesting because at the time, and this was either the late 90s or the early 2000s, um, they had signs up on the box office that, that like were basically warnings saying this film is in French with English subtitles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Viewer, was, beware. You yeah. have to read. You yeah. will have beware. to use your eyes. So it's just, no, but I think it's- Brotherhood of the Wolf? Brotherhood of the Wolf, that's it. That's what, Thank you. Thank you for giving it a goog. <laughs> you know what's interesting back to that though? So I actually watch all my shows with subtitles on all the time or closed captioning because I, one of my things is I, there's a lot that I miss, especially when there's- um, mm -hmm. I just feel like I learn a lot when they put the subtitles in or the closed captioning, because it'll always be like secret dialogue that you don't actually hear. So in the movie, I don't, yeah, I don't know that I overly noticed that it was mm -hmm. in Mandarin mm -hmm. for the first part. I didn't notice. So I don't know if that's an anomaly, but I, it just felt. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah. No, I'm yeah, glad I didn't it, notice. it feels authentic. I think the next step that needs to happen. Uh, so, so Sarah, my wife, again, she has to yeah. deal with this all the time is, um, uh, you know, we need to get to a point where it's no longer translations and it starts yes. to become really the term is localization. Yep. And there are times, uh, Shang-Chi doesn't have it too many times like this, but I, for some reason, we rewatched re um, certain scenes from Rush Hour the other day. Okay. Mm. And I was explaining, you know, I was, I was, I was say, I will literally translate like <laughs> what he's saying. And then <laughs> I'll give you the context, like actually what he's meaning. Hmm. And they were just, completely like completely right. different oh, yeah no yeah. you know Aww. because you would have a phrase on something and y you know you would think oh okay like I as an example it, this wasn't um rush hour but it was um this uh this chinese movie with seven lucky kids who basically like hmm. act as cops and like break other kids like rescue kids and stuff like that anyway Aww. i watched it as a kid but there's these subtitles and the guy would be saying like blah 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 and then fart okay like <laughs> the word fart <laughs> And, and that's what it said. And we used to laugh because it said fart and, you know, we're obviously <laughs> like eight, but also it do fart doesn't mean fart in that context. You know, it means like, mm. like, like BS or bull crap or mm. whatever, like, like you're wrong, you know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah so it just completely means something different. I'm like, oh, I get it. Like they just like, you know, completely what just translate that. It's fart. really funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I think 
with us making the short that we made in Korea, we actually inadvertently probably ended up doing a better translation in both languages because the subtitles that we used were actually just the English script. And mm-hmm. then, you know, we had the Korean and it was because I was working directly with a Korean speaker yeah, to, yeah. to make the translation. It probably actually is a much better translation for everyone involved. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be great if one day, you know, people start to learn and, and get that mm-hmm. fart just means something different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think the talking about like going next, I think by not forcing the hand of it, but how like what Chung Chi did is where it you just have to read the subtitles. I think by just putting it in front of in front of the audience and be like, this is what it is. So you'll yeah. eventually learn the contextual you know of what's being said and just put it out there and just we got to catch up like it is what it is present it as its authentic self and let's just meet it there i don't think well, and like yeah, sarah said that like the audience isn't dumb and trust it is the respect audience, trust yeah. the audience that they're going to be fine with it um yeah. yeah and and like in a different tone but we've talked about this so i have a daughter who is transgender and one of the things that bothers me in a way is like when they make it so obvious when it's mm-hmm. like this is the token lgbtq individual in the movie and it's like well just let them be in the movie <laughs> just let it be yeah. just like normalize this flow um so i think in a lot of ways between just cultures and representation i i think we it's great that we get there but then if we can just make it less forced if we can make yeah. it like yeah. seamless to where you're like oh wow i didn't even notice because i just went along and enjoyed the story and these were all the characters that played a part of it i think it'd be really exciting to see just moving forward and sci-fi does a great job with this in science fiction of just normalizing a lot of these variations of self and culture. And I think that's why I think a lot of us stuck together in this zone is because it feels really comfortable because we can kind of get away with varying spaces because it is again, science fiction, but when you put it into like real world dynamics and put it into like Marvel universe, it still at times can feel a little bit forced. Like here's the token, this token, that, Sure. Um, so I would like to see us just go forward with more of that, more of us yeah. forcing to read subtitles and just let it be what it is and not have to make a big deal. Like this is the spot where yeah. we're having appropriation. <laughs> like, just- so can I, can I, um, Christina, yeah. ask your, and, yeah. and, and every, all three of you, your perspectives and advice, I suppose, on this, which is um, I totally, so, so my, my dream or my mm-hmm. vision, and I'm sure you share it as well is a character is just mm-hmm. a character or a topic yes. is just a topic and right. they happen to be gay or transgender or mm-hmm. Chinese. That's mm-hmm. just what they are. It doesn't right. matter. Um, but one of the things that um, I was debating personally with Amanda's event, as an example, uplifting mm-hmm. women mm-hmm. in film and television. And the original idea was, well, why do we even have to say that? Why don't we just have Sam Mag's, and Amanda mm. Tapping talk about filmmaking. And of course, they're going to use examples, mm-hmm. you know, with women and, and you know, because they're women. And someone had also said to me, well, I don't think we're there yet. And I think mm-hmm. what you need to do is also still support and highlight the fact that this is what the topic is. And so, Agreed. Yeah, I guess, yeah. So, um, go ahead. Sorry. I do have a response to it. It feels very, um, if we can go into this space, um, in, in an appropriate conversation, it feels very all lives matter versus black lives matter type of conversation, because right now it's not saying that all, like, we're just not there yet. So I do think it is important to do it that way because it's about equity and about making sure that we kind of build those platforms to rise these individuals or um, minorities of mm-hmm. <laughs> into that space. And then once we get there, then we don't need to have that conversation anymore. But until we're systemically equalized, you know, we need to have that. Yeah. Um, so to me, and it might I, not be in our, it feels that way. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. But. It's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. No, they, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Go, go. I asked all three of you, and I'm just jumping in now. So. Oh, no, no, no. Dialogue. Dialogue. This is a conversation. So I, I, I mean, it's, it's the thing that I think all three of us have a lot to say about. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we're like, me first. I mean, because, because Christina has her daughter. Um, like I said, mm-hmm. I did a feature film that is like the main character is non binary, and the character is it's it's kind of it's a it's a soft sci-fi story in that there are 
two parallel realities. And in one of them, the character is not realizing who they are yet. And the other one, they are, and they manage to start talking to each other. So, so it is like, it's, it's the whole point of the movie is pointing out that this character is non-binary. Um, but in it, we also got to show a couple of other characters that we don't really hang lanterns on with like who they are. Like there's another transgender person in it that we don't really ever address, you know, very strongly there who they are other than they get yelled at one time or something. It's like, it's not, and it's just like, it is their life and that's what happens. Um, but like Christina says, and she said this actually in defense of a troll on one of my videos mm -hmm. where I was uh, very angry about the the idea of people pitting women against women and they do it all the time. And um, it was pretty much the same exact thing that she just said about we're, we aren't there yet. Like we'd love to be like, this is, we're just talking about a character versus a character, but, or, or this or that, but we, we still have work to do. And we, you know, saying, titling your event, you know, uplifting women in film is very, very important and guaranteed that is why I came and watched it because, mm -hmm. because that's what it was titled. You mm -hmm. know, I, I love Amanda Tapping. That's fine. But I would not have actually been like, I'm going to take this time out of my day to watch this live, but it was because of what specifically was being said. And that's, that's like the work that is the work. That's what we, mm -hmm. we have to be doing right now. So that, uh, at some point in the future, we don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think it all is about context because I have seen examples of characters just being characters and the story is great, but I have, you, you still have to represent and you don't want to do a disservice to people like Amanda Tapping who are women in the film industry and have experienced a lot of terrible, awful crap. Mm -hmm. So without let her tell her story like that. But again, like I, I see examples of both, but in those other examples of characters being characters, whatever it, if they're, you know, a part of the LGBTQ community, whatever the context, that's not the main part of the story. The story is about something else. And then this character happens to be X, Y, and Z. But I, those stories about the struggle or whatever the context is are still important to hear. And like Christina said, we're not there yet. So we don't want to do a disservice to the people who have struggled for so long and continue to struggle um, with oppression, systemic mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to do a service and, and not let them tell their story and bring more awareness to it. Um, but I can see examples of, again, characters just being characters. And I think that's wonderful too. Yeah. I think it's also how I read, I, so I read this article about this new Netflix Christmas rom-com that's coming out called like Single All the Way. And it's, <laughs> it's bear with me here. I'm getting to a point. Oh, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's a gay, it's a gay man who is the main character in Single All the Way. Mm. Um, but unlike whatever Kristen Stewart Christmas movie that they came out with last year or whatever, which was all about a coming out story and it's awkward and it feels like a gay story made for straight people mm. more than this one. People are talking about, no, the, he is, he's, he's just gay. And he's, he's very, very obviously gay. There's no, like, you know, the whole, the whole idea is that he goes home to his family. He convinces his friend to come with him and be like, oh, we're dating because they're tired of him not dating. But, but mm. everybody already knows that he's gay. Like mm. there's, yeah, yeah. there is, there is zero conflict with the family about the fact that he's gay, which is right. what this article was talking about, how apparently refreshing it is because mm. of that, because that is a more genuine, uh, portrayal and a genuine story. Um, yeah. To the point where I'm going to end up watching this cheesy <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. movie because I want to see it now that I've read this article about it. But well, and I th I think it's important because so like if I'm thinking about like you know companion or like whatever can be like extrapolated from all these experiences going, on, I do think yeah it is important to, um, yeah ultimately just recapping what we just said it, <laughs> to just the same thing I, in I, summation I think it would be nice in summation like <laughs> i think it's great to have both um but i do think that you don't just throw it under the rug and say we're good we don't need to talk about it because it's sexism is solved guys we don't it's have to talk not, about it you know, like... you know but it also doesn't need to be a whole vigilante like focus like it's just these are uplifting women and then if it happened to be like a commentary on yeah um 
you know, people of color, like in certain situations and just having that be a focus. And I think really just rising to the platform, these different focus groups. And I, especially like I'm thinking about within um, the companion, because you do have that, you know, that pay barrier. So I think you got a lot of the assholes cut out of the way Mm. that people that are there are there because they're interested to hear those specialized things and to grow their mindset. So I made a, I may not have known that this is a focus that should have existed Meaning like if there was an article written around, you know, transgender individuals in film, I would have been like, oh, that's interesting. I never would have even thought through that. What's that experience like? And because I'm in your space and in in part of your this group, I know it's going to be good content and a safe space for me to go and explore it. So I think it is important to keep doing that and to keep pushing and educating and bringing those groups of people together. Um, Yeah. So no, in summary, we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, no, that's good. I'm. I'm glad. I'm glad we. We. Um, you know, reverted. I guess Sorry. back to the original <laughs> idea of, of, of pushing women in, in film and television. But it is. It was one of those thoughts. You know that. Oh, it'd be so cool uh, if I put it into my own context of. This is just what this thing is. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's two Asian people. Mm-hmm. Whereas right now, I think we still need to say, "Hey, Shang Chi was a really successful Asian film, was it?" Like, yeah, Asian yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to though, because I mean, it yeah, just yeah. because otherwise it just gets lumped in, and you don't realize what an accolade that is to like be given. Right. It it deserves its pedestal for a while, you know. It deserves to stay there. Yeah, yeah. It's that. always that argument of yeah, it, because it's 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 a some sort of marginalized group or or identity or anything like that. Um, shining that light on it is important Mm -hmm. and i think like christina said it's the blm versus all lives matter sort of argument um Mm -hmm. in in a different context but it it's it feels like the same sort of argument so yeah 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 it kind of makes me sad when you said like you felt that extra pressure of like oh my gosh i hope it's successful like i i feel this pressure i want it to work Mm -hmm. out and all these things are against it because you know that there are people out there that have never had to think about that or worry about mm-hmm. that ever when it comes mm-hmm. to watching a movie. They don't have that. That's not even a thought in their mind. And then, you know, the thing that comes to mind for me right away is like Captain Marvel about how like mm-hmm. that was just the way like, okay, it's one of the first female led superhero movies. And yeah. there's that a kind of pressure for like, oh my God, I hope it does good because then if it does, maybe we'll see more. But then like the press and the media behind it was like total hot garbage and it, oh, they trashed it for yeah so like no good and, reason <laughs> right so mm-hmm. whether you think the movie is good or not like besides the point like as women like we felt that extra pressure in other movies as well of like oh my gosh i hope this does good i hope this does well when there's demographics of people out there who have never had to worry about that ever when it comes yeah, to like yeah. a tv show or a movie and that really kind of just makes me really sad that we feel that extra pressure of hoping that this thing that represents me in this way x y and z does good so that i can see yeah, more of, of it. course yeah it does, if that doesn't do well you know um a black widow you know, oh, you mm-hmm. can't have a lead that gets canned you know exactly and then, like, exactly this, this domino effect of you know, well, we gave it a shot, you know, we put the marketing behind it. It didn't work. Oh, no, yeah. Um, so back to, uh, back to no representation then, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's such a great dialogue. Thank you for having this. It was a little bit of our side tangent. We tend to go on these, but this is such a cool dialogue. Oh, Thank no, you yeah. for this question. No, thanks for including me in it. And yeah, and, uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know it's, really late there now yes. so um we can we can wrap this up now i mean i feel like we could keep talking but maybe you can just come on again sometime and talk <laughs> yeah yeah um but uh so yeah everybody that's out there that's listening if you haven't already gone on to the companion and paid your two dollars a month it's totally <laughs> worth it i highly recommend yes. Um, I spent all day just reading different articles, um, that I hadn't been able to get to yet. And I was like, well, this is my excuse because I want, I want to, to read up. And, um, some recent ones that I really liked were, uh, the set, speaking of representation set, the seven of nine, um, article was yeah. really interesting to me about, I hadn't even thought about her story in that context of like her story coming out of the Borg being like a coming out sort of thing, but mm-hmm. It was pretty fascinating. Anyway, everybody go read the articles. Yes. <laughs> um, and watch all the videos and listen to the podcast. It's been um, amazing to talk to you, Lawrence. Yes. Um, 
we do have a tradition here on Three Fresh Fruit, which I'm sure you know if you've listened to any of our things. But to the um, very end, oh, no. <laughs> if you've listened to the very the end, oh. um, we uh, somebody has to close the iris at the end of every episode. Um, and since you are our guest, I'm going to ask you if you can close the iris for us this week. Um, in any way you would like right we you confused colin cunningham a lot last week he was like how do i do <laughs> so <the> confused <laughs> you close just have to pretend you're walter telling someone to close the iris yeah in your own way okay. um all right well um this was a lot of fun <laughs> and uh there's almost too much energy uh coming through the stargate and so we're gonna have to close down the iris right now i guess <laughs> does, that, oh, does that work i love that yeah perfect perfect, perfect. Okay. <laughs>